can imagine, to design thoughtfully cool buildings, one would need to understand the relationship between the building and the only source of energy that the entire planet has, the sun. Its study and the way it influences a building or a site is known as solar geometry, which is the subject of this training session. In this training session, we'll first look at how the sun moves around in the sky and how it changes based on time of the year as well as the specific latitude that that specific place is in. We will then understand how we can mark the position of the sun in the sky for any time of the year and develop an instinctive feel for that specific location in the sky because this location will affect the design of the various facades of the building. Uh, as we can perhaps uh, have uh, perhaps have recorded in our experiences in traveling to um, interiors of India which are not urbanized, you would see a marked difference in the various facades of a, of a, a single story home for example where the western facade, the eastern, northern and southern would have different kinds of designs because the sun when present in that region of the sky has a certain specific angle and certain specific solar radiation characteristics. We learn about all of those when we understand the position of the sun. And finally, we will utilize all this knowledge of the sun's movement, its different characteristics in different parts of the sky in designing shading devices to shield buildings from this harsh grueling sun while also promoting daylight uh, ingress into the building. Right. So, key takeaways from this session for people who wish to train other people uh, on this subject. One is that at the end of this training session, you should be able to read very comfortably what's called a solar chart. This is the solar equivalent of what's called a psychrometric chart, which was addressed earlier. This deals with heat psychrometry dealt with temperature, humidity and the mixture. We will also be going through teaching aids and exercises to build associative memory, build muscle memory and build interest in the subject of understanding the sun which was actually a, a skill that previous generations had and was used for, for uh, eons by farmers, by navigators to be able to plan their activities of for example farming in, in terms of when should you be sowing, when should you be harvesting, which time of the year will have a lot of solar radiation, which time of the year will not have adequate solar radiation, so on and so forth. And also for, by navigators to understand their position in the oceans in relation to the uh, position of the sun in the sky. We will also then look at how all this knowledge can be used by practicing architects or students to apply in their building design to lead to thoughtful buildings. One can you know, imagine that any subject which is just imposed upon the, uh, the students or the audience that wants to learn that subject, if there isn't adequate interest in this, you know, there's, it's unlikely to have a lot of motivation during the, the teaching process or the learning process. So how do we get our students to care about this? A simple way to kickstart this activity uh, with students to get them interested in understanding the sun is to take them out of their whole digital obsession of using devices, electronic devices or their computers to tell time. Can we create an activity where the ancient skill of being able to tell time by just looking at the sun uh, after stepping out from a building, you could be able to tell the time just based on that. So this activity is to take your students out of the classroom, ask them to tell the time without the help of watches or their cell phones by just looking at the position of the sun. How high is it? In which part of the sky is it? Is it already moved to the west or is it still in the east? These kinds of instinctive feelings uh, can be recreated and this can become the, uh, the trigger activity for your students to get interested in solar geometry. Another activity to get students to care about the subject is to see how buildings already, uh, at least non hypermodern buildings uh, which had some variation of, the, of different designs on different facades for example, that can be used as a teaching aid to generate interest in seeing how the position of the sun affects facade design. So one could walk around the college neighborhood and look at 
the different facades of buildings around there to see if the east, north, west and south have different shading strategies according to the hours of the sunlight received. And this documentation, experiential exercise could build immense amount of interest and create a sort of uh, empathy for understanding the sun as a very important factor if they want to become thoughtful, responsible building designers. So let's now understand the sun and how it moves through the sky. A lot of this takes us back into high school geography uh, and we might think it's too rudimentary but the, the erosion of these skills has been part of the rupturing of the knowledge base related to passive design. So let's try and uh, rebuild some of that knowledge uh, in, this, in this training session. All right. So why is the sun important uh, or understanding the sun's uh, movement through the sky? It's important because not only is it a source of something that is uh, harmful uh, to energy efficiency, which means too much ingress of solar heat gain, but it is also something that is, is a beneficial factor, right? Natural light necessarily is required for visual comfort, for, the, for enhancing the experience and the comfort of, of the occupants. But not only that, solar radiation can also be used advantageously for cooling purposes. There is a cooling technology which we will do some training around called the solar air conditioning or solar vapor absorption system. That system uses the sun's heat beneficially to create cooling out of it. So it might be useful to also know of creative ways to harness this energy, but we can only do this if we know where the sun is and how intense it is in a certain part of the sky. All right, so of course, the reason why it's important is the sun is a source of daylight on earth for sure, but the duality is that it's also the source of heat. And this interplay of light and heat is a cross-cutting theme throughout all of uh, thoughtful design or passive design and, and balancing these two competing needs is, uh, is a very fine art which we will try and um, learn uh, over this training session. Okay, so let's understand what is solar radiation? It is comprised of what are called electromagnetic waves or it is transmitted through the medium of electromagnetic waves, which are waves which can travel through a vacuum as we all know. Uh, its subcomponents are these. The first is what's called ultraviolet radiation. The second part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which has got lesser energy than this first one, is called the visible radiation, which is what comprises the natural light that we like to have inside. And the lowest energy part, but still very dominant, is the infrared radiation. This is what carries the heat energy inside a building, right? So not all parts of the solar radiation are equivalent. There are some parts that you want to promote. For example, you want to promote more visible radiation, but you want to inhibit infrared radiation. The unit of measurement is energy, watt hour, right? Not power, watt hour per meter square. And as we can all verify from life experience that it varies with time of the day, with the latitude, which means the further north you go, the sun is going to have less intensity. This is something that we all intuitively know. And of course, at different times of the year, right? Uh, the watt hours per meter square will change based on all these three variables. Right. This is a pictorial depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum of the solar radiation that comes to Earth. Here on the x-axis, we have wavelength increasing to the right. And on the y-axis, we have energy in terms of what hours per square meter, right? Um, what this is indicating is as, sorry, watts per square meter. This is power per square meter, not energy. As I go to the right, I can see that the quantity of the spectrum, right? That's the sum of the area under this curve is quite high when taken together. This is all heat. This is the part of the radiation we want to keep out. It is low energy radi radiation, but it hurts the building because of the total quantity of it. You can see the visible spectrum is a, a high energy part of the spectrum, which is the short wavelength part. In itself, it doesn't comprise a large part of the area. But if it is allowed to not come in, right, or if it is somehow reflected, we lose a lot of natural light that we would otherwise want in the building. 
the ultraviolet spectrum is not of much use. In fact, it is the, the, the part of the spectrum which we necessarily need to try and avoid from coming in because it's a direct health hazard. And this has got to do with uh, the, the repercussions of not having adequate ozone layer protection that would exacerbate this, this condition of very high energy ultraviolet rays coming in. All right, yes. So daylight is a scattered component of the solar radiation, which is actually a mixture of all of this. Now, we're gonna start understanding a little bit and develop a visual sense of the movement of the sun around the sky. As one can imagine, say if one was standing in a northern uh, in the northern hemisphere, looking at the sun, as in, uh, if the sun was south of, of you, right, which is the, the case it would be for most of the year, the sun would be on the southern side. Now this chart here creates, uh, it depicts an imaginary ribbon in the sky, which is called the solar window. And each of these lines represents one day of the year, right. Now one can imagine that in June, 21st, which is peak summer, the trajectory of the sun in the sky would be from east to west in this direction. The sun would start to some degree in the northern hemisphere, right? Not exactly due east, it would start slightly in the northern hemisphere, make its way through the sky, right? At noon it would be overhead and then would set slightly further beyond west. The reason why, you know, it, it needs to start earlier then east and end after west is because in summer you have longer days which means more than 12 hours so for that it needs more time in the sky if it were to start at pure east and set at pure west you would have exactly 12 hour days which is the case only in the equator so in the northern hemisphere you will see the angle or the the arc that is drawn is not perfectly hemispherical from east to west it's slightly to the to the uh, starting a little bit above uh, before east which means slightly northeast right here and setting slightly northwest right okay so that's the case in, Jan in june 21st when the sun is at its peak intensity in winter as the the earth's angle relative to the sun changes you can see that the sun is lower in the sky and it spends much less than 12 hours in the sky for a place in the northern hemisphere which means that it will start slightly south of east so it will start in the southeast and it will set in the southwest through the day in between both these extremities the sun will always be present somewhere within these two extremities and hence one can almost imagine a ribbon in the sky which is called the solar window this is an instinct that one should cultivate as a designer for every specific region the window will be slightly different and we will look at the position of these solar windows these imaginary solar windows a little bit later All right so this is a better depiction i think than the previous one of the solar window for a place in the northern hemisphere right now one can imagine that this is specific to the location that you're in as one goes further north one can imagine that this window actually tilts downwards, right? So one way to think of this is that the sun could be, say, the screen in a movie theater and you are a person sitting in a reclining chair. As you go further north, in a way, the screen is dipping in front of you, right? You're, going for, you're reclining further back because you're going further north, which means that the sun's, all the sun's activities will be happening in a lower band. Whereas if I come closer, which means I'm clo coming closer to the equator, in a way the screen is rising in front of me and that creates a window which is more perpendicular to the horizon. Yeah, so one can imagine a hinge point here and as you change latitude, the solar window keeps changing its, its position in the sky. Right? Okay. This is a question we would like to uh, engage all of us in. It is a very important idea which is again part of high school geography but because of our lack of familiarity with those concepts in current design and the lack of use of these ideas 
in these uh, in modern building design we have often forgotten the underlying reasons for something like this so the question is what causes seasons and by seasons we mean periods of differing temperatures and heat intensities throughout the year for the same location right why don't we have the same kind of solar radiation and heat heating conditions throughout the year for a specific location one can imagine it can be different as you change your location but why is it different through the year is it a rotation of the earth b revolution of the earth c rotation and revolution d the varying distance from the sun along the orbit or is it what's called the earth's tilt the declination angle of the earth so let's see what the answer is the answer is that it's the tilt of the earth's axis now one very simple way to internalize this idea is this that if the earth and the sun were perfectly symmetrical in terms of their relative positioning if it was for example just two balls you know sort of orbiting each other there would be no difference in any part of that entire uh, circumference where there would be any difference from day 1 to day 2 so what we are trying to allude to over here is that we need some amount of asymmetry for one day to be distinguishable from another and that is what the consequence of the earth's tilt is so we'll explore this idea a little bit further so it's none of these other reasons it's only the declination angle of the earth which causes seasons for the same location right so let's understand what this declination angle means this declination angle essentially means that there is a axis of rotation which is which in the next slide we will we will see what it is and this is the horizontal plane that cuts through the sun and the earth so the earth sort of slides along this plane right uh, in the solar system the angle of the axis is not perpendicular to this plane it is actually at a 23 degree 23 and a half degree angle yes so this angle is 23 and a half this makes all the difference if this was per perfectly perpendicular to the plane each day would be the same as it rotated or revolved around the sun there would be no distinguishing it is this transformation or the slight shift which distinguishes day 1 from day 2 and in a very extreme case summer and winter and we'll look at that in the next slide right so that is 23 and a half degrees is this angle all right so this is a depiction of the movement of the earth throughout the entire year and you can imagine the sun in the center this is the northern hemisphere this is the southern hemisphere as you can see in the sun was here in the in june on june 21st the the northern hemisphere is almost pointing into the sun right you can see it's it's almost leaning in this is almost like the in, instance of the chair and the movie screen you are reclining forward which means the sun is going to be higher up in the sky and is going to have more of a direct influence this in a way indicates that the northern hemisphere is feeling a high intensity of the sun in this time of the year which is why it's experiencing summer the latter part is almost facing away from the sun at this time of the year and hence this part of the of the earth is experiencing winter as it goes through the years or through the different months of the year it moves into september here the angle of rotation is neither leaning into the sun or leaning away from the sun here it is perfectly neutral with respect to the sun which necess which essentially creates a condition where both halves of the earth receive equal solar radiation the north and south are no different from each other in this these two positions these are complementary positions on other sides of the earth this is march 21st this is september 21st so these are what are called equinoxes which means equal day equal night and north and south are indistinguishable in terms of their weather conditions this is the other extremity this is the exact opposite of summer this is december 21st these this is called summer solstice this is called winter solstice this is where the northern hemisphere is leaning away from the sun and the southern hemisphere is leaning into the sun which means summer is happening here and winter is happening here 
So as we can see a simple change in the angle of the rotation or the axis of rotation creates all this difference. If these were all vertical, each day would be the same and there would be no seasons on earth. Okay, now let's understand what are the implications of the declination. Why does it cause season, right? So we understood it is the angle that causes the leaning and leaning out. But so what? What can we uh, infer further from that fact? So here is a series of red dots on, on uh, these pictorial depictions of the earth at different times of the year. And one can imagine an axis piercing through the earth from the south pole to the north pole going this way, right? Now, one can imagine that as the earth rotates in each of these locations, a certain point here, it rotates along or in a manner that is symmetrical around this axis, right? It is not symmetrical around the sem the hemisphere, it is symmetrical around this axis. So for example, if you had a city here through the day, it would rotate like this, right? Now, as one can imagine, depending on where you are, of course, on the earth, because of this angle of rotation, each location does not spend an equal amount of time in the sun, an equal amount of time away from the sun. You will see that in this case, a city that is here will spend almost all its time in the sun and a very short period of time in the, in the, in the night, right? So it'll have very long days, short nights, very long days, short nights. Here, it would be the exact opposite. Here, this is the Northern Hemisphere winter. You'll see that a, a location here will have a large part of the day in night and a short day. Large part of the night and a short day. Whereas here, in the equinoxes, it will be the exact same, right? So these are 12 hour, 12 day nights. So this is one of the implications that the sun or the, the location is spending different amounts of time under the sun at different times of the year. So the first implication is that as the earth's angle or the, the angle of rotation changes throughout the year relative to the sun, the intensity of the solar radiation changes. So for example, when you're leaning into a source of heat, one can imagine the heat coming in in a very concentrated form on a small area. So this is, for example, a beam of light that is falling perpendicular or normal to the surface. This is the example of Northern Hemisphere summer. It's at 342 watts per meter square. Now the same beam, if I tilt it, and we can do this experiment with a torchlight. If I were to take a flashlight and hold it over uh, uh, normal to the surface, it would create a very concentrated spotlight on the ground. Whereas the same beam, if I just shift it to a certain angle, you will see that it spreads over a larger horizontal area, which is what is happening here. You can see that 342 watts per meter square is becoming 242 watts per meter square, which is a dropping off of approximately 30%. One third of it is dropping off. This is the case of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. The sunlight is spread over more area, which, which is why it feels a little cooler. Right? So this is the first implication of the declination of the Earth's axis. The angle of solar radiation changes. The second implication of that declination of the Earth's axis is that the sunlight travels through different distances depending on whether the axis is leaning into the sun or leaning away from the sun. So in the Northern Hemisphere summer, when you're leaning into the sun, the sunlight, not only is it more concentrated, but it is also spending as little time through the atmosphere as compared to when it is in the summer, when it's leaning away. Now, one might ask, so what? Why does the traveling through the atmosphere matter? Well, it is true that the sun, the solar radiation travels large distances before it gets to the earth. So there could be a lot of dissipation that happens in that period itself. However, that is a vacuum, right? And solar radiation does not diffuse because of vacuum conditions. There are no physical materials available to dissipate it. However, the moment it strikes the atmosphere, which is uh, inordinately more dense than vacuum, for instance, you would start seeing a lot of scattering of solar radiation. So this, is, this can sort of be thought of as lots of clouds in the atmosphere, which disperse solar radiation, which reduces the intensity that is eventually fell on Earth.
So the shorter the distance that has to travel through the atmosphere, the more intense is the solar radiation that you eventually experience. So the second uh, impl implication of the declination of the Earth's axis is that in the northern hemisphere summer for instance, not only is the light to begin with more concentrated, it also is dispersed less because it comes more directly to the Earth, right? whereas it's the opposite in the northern hemisphere winter. The final implication which completes the whole picture of why there are differing periods of heat and cool throughout the year at a certain location is the amount of time a certain location spends under the sun. So you can almost think of it as a child playing you know, in, in the summer uh, vacations. You can imagine that the child spends so much time in the playground outside and very little time at home that at the end of the summer vacation the child gets tanned, right? they've absorbed a lot of solar radiation. This is sort of what is happening with northern hemisphere cities in the summer. Here is a chart which shows you the amount of time that is spent in the sun by cities in different latitudes. So across the year. So for example, for a relatively very northern city, you will see for example for 70 degrees north, in the middle of summer, in peak summer, this is June solstice, June 21st, you can see that it spends all of its hours in the daylight, 24 hours, right? Whereas in winter, for example, in December, it spends almost no time in daylight. That's an extreme case. But something more like, say, uh, Indian cities, uh, say Mumbai is 23, 23 degrees north, this could be something like this, where you see in June, you have about 14 hour days, right? Which is the peak of summer. Whereas peak of winter, you can go all the way down to about nine hour days. So that's a five hour difference in the length of the day and, and night, which means, of course, in summer, the earth and the, the, the oceans around the region will get baked much more and give an experience of summer conditions versus winter. Here is an animation developed by the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which can be used by teachers to show these impacts uh, and the relative influences of latitude, time of the day, time of the year, on the angle of the sun on, this, on the earth. This could be a, uh, an interesting teaching aid to explain the reason for the occurrence of seasons. In many instances in answering the previous question about whether the Earth's elliptical orbit is a possible cause of the seasons that we see on Earth, uh, sometimes students and, and people who aren't very, uh, very clear about their geogra geographical concepts, they often answer that it is true that the elliptical orbit of the earth is one of the reasons for the seasons that we see here. However, one must emphatically stamp out that idea. It is not uh, even a minor cause of the seasons on the earth. This is because, in fact, when the earth is the furthest away from the sun is when the northern hemisphere has its summer. So, of course, it is not the proximity of the earth to the to the sun at different times of the year that matters. In fact, that difference is first of all very marginal compared to the overall distance. And also it does not explain why at the same time you have summer in the northern hemisphere and winter in the southern hemisphere. That is purely because of the tilt, right? Because if it was, if the entire earth was far away, then the north and south would experience similar sort of differences. However, it's the inversion 
that alludes to the fact that there is a tilt of the Earth's axis, right? So that's what this just goes on to explain. Right. So now that we know the transformation of the uh, seasons through the uh, through the year because of the declination of the Earth's axis, let's see if we can get in, more zoomed in into the position of the sun in the sky for different times of the day and for different days of the year. So now just going beyond the crude uh, distinction of summer, winter, equinoxes, etc. Let's go into more detail and that's the position of the sun in the sky. To be able to understand or be able to define the position of the sun uh, in the sky without using <laughs> landmarks, etc. One would need to use some sort of universal uh, mechanism to classify the position of the sun. So just like you have in planar geometry or planar coordinate geometry, you have x and y coordinates. Similar sort of coordinate systems are used to define the position of the sun, which is a three-dimensional object, of course, in a three-dimensional reality, which is the, the, the dome above, uh, above the earth, the sky dome above the earth. So those two parameters are called azimuth and altitude. These are the two coordinates and we'll see what they mean. But just fixing these two is sufficient to define where the sun is in the sky. All right, so let's dissect this a little bit further. What is the azimuth? The azimuth very simply is the angle the sun has swept through the day when I drop a line from the sun to the horizon, right? So that point, as it goes through the day, one can imagine it sweeps an angle starting from the morning through the afternoon and to the night. So say, for example, it starts, uh, the, the sun rises in the east. That would be approximately 90 degrees as a starting point compared to due north. In this chart here, they have used one convention, which is measuring the angle from north via the west. In some countries, in India especially, the angle is measured from the north via the east to the south. Right, so it would be 360 minus this value. You can see here that this is a place that is uh, where the sun is uh, the rising right in the east, due east. So at this point, at sunrise, the azimuth would be 90 degrees. As it goes through halfway point of the day, which is noon, it would be 180 degrees. And at set point, at, at the point where it's where it sets, it's at 270 degrees. So the azimuth is the angle that is traced by a direct point dropped from the sun onto the horizon and the angle that it makes with the due north via the east. That's the azimuth. Right? The second quantity that one must know is what's called, oh, this is another picture. This one actually shows it the way it is appropriate for Indian designers because these are the angles that are reported in weather charts, etc. Right, so this is the azimuth angle of the sun when a line is dropped from the horizon, the angle it makes with due north via east. The second element of fixing the sun's position in the sky is what's called altitude. This is the angle a, a straight line to the sun would make from the observer to the horizon. So this is the angle that the sun is making, a direct line from here to the sun and what angle is it tracing with the line that goes to the horizon? Of course, in summer, one can imagine as the sun is higher in the sky at almost all times, the altitudes will be higher, whereas in winter, the altitudes in general will be lower. So that is the altitude. And we have another picture depicting that angle. All right. This is a demonstration. It's an animation again, uh, which can be used by teachers as a way of demonstrating the implications of different times of the day and different times of the year on the azimuth and altitude angles of the sun. Mm -hmm.
Now, let's conduct an imaginary or, or, or a thought experiment. Imagine it was possible to actually trace a line in the sky for every day of the year and having those imaginary dotted lines, for example, be viewed from above the sun. Right? So if I was an aerial observer right, and I could see those lines of, of, uh, of traversing the sky by the sun and I could then conduct a 2D projection exercise and flatten those lines on the earth, you would end up with what's called a sun path diagram right? or a solar projection. This is what we are going to see next. So essentially what we are saying is take one day of the year draw a dotted line and do the same thing for all other 365, three other 364 days and then try to flatten it into a two-dimensional reality. What would that look like? That would look like a little bit like the next chart. So in this chart, this is a, a very classical, what's called a solar projection or a sun path diagram. These lines here are the sun path lines. Each of these blue lines indicates the path the sun would take in the sky but when projected down to two dimensions right so there are multiple components to this just like in psychrometry there are multiple layers to the chart here also there are multiple layers about four layers to this chart so the first layer is what's called the azimuth layer which is the angles that are marked here out in yellow as you can see it starts with due north which is considered 0 15 30 so on and so forth all the way to 360. So that's the azimuth. The second layer is what's called the altitude. The altitude is the angle of the sun as we know compared to the horizon and you can see it starts with zero and keeps increasing all the way up to 90 which is perfectly perpendicular to the observer. So that's the altitude. The next layer is what's called the date or this is actually called the sun path. The sun path through the sky of our, our specific day. So there are 365 such lines here for purposes of keeping the image clean and usable for analysis. They only have one day of every month, the first day of the month. And for the rest, we might be able to interpolate to get the specific um, line that's uh, relevant for that day. The fourth layer is what's called the hour layer, which is each of these curved lines indicates a certain hour. Now the reason why there is a backward curve is because there is a part of this curve which is relevant for intersecting with lines starting from the right and the forward part of the curve is relevant for points starting from the left. Um, this is not very clear in this image but essentially there is solid day lines and dotted day lines. This is just a matter of, of uh, syntax because uh, depending on which month we are speaking of. So for example, the 1st of January here is a dotted line, whereas the 1st of December here is the solid line. Now for each of these curves, for, for example, if I wanted to find the intersection between 8 o'clock and 1st of January, I would choose what's called the dotted part of the curve. So this is the other side of the curve. I would look for the intersection of the dotted line with the dotted curve to find out where the sun's position is. Nonetheless, there are in this case, 13 hour lines, which means the earliest time that the sun rises is at 6 a.m. or a little bit before that. Of course, that will be in summer, right? Long days. And the latest it would set is a little bit after 7 p.m. Beyond that, the sun is not in the sky, beyond those hours. All these four pieces of information or four layers of information are useful in determining the position of the sun in the sky for a given day and for a given hour of the year. Now, uh, before we go any further, one can see that summer months, for example, June, right? June is peak summer. Here you can see the sun is rising in the northern hemisphere, as we had indicated in the, in the short exercise we did in the beginning part of the presentation, that you won't rise exactly at due east. Because you need a long period of time in the sky, you would try to rise or the sun does rise in the northeast and sets in the northwest. Whereas in winter, you can tell it rises in the southeast. Here 
and, and sets very quickly in the southwest, which means the shortest path here and here is the longest path. So this is the longest day of the year for this place and this is the shortest day of the year for this place. All right, here is a very macro zoomed out level solar chart, which does not really need one to read specific values. This is a chart that has been designed to provide students or people interested in learning about solar geometry to see if we can cultivate some sort of instinct about what the sun path looks like for different locations on the earth as a function of the latitude. All right. So if one notices or if one uh, looks carefully, one can see that for the equator, a place like Nairobi for instance, which has a latitude almost equivalent to the equator, there is complete symmetry in the sun path, which means that throughout the year, the sun has a similar pattern for one half and for the other half, it's the exact converse and it is perfectly symmetrical, symmetrical around this zero line. And you will also see that you don't have very, very long days. You don't have a lot of curvature and you don't have very short days either. The days are relatively similar in length. Whereas if you go further north, for example, this is the northernmost city that we have here, Moscow. Here you can see the sun will rise very, very early in the day and it will rise to a great extent in the northeast, in the, in the early part of the northeast, early angles of the northeast and set in the late angles of northwest, right? Whereas in winter, it will rise very late and set very early. So you can see a very steep sort of curve for northern places, a very symmetrical set of curves for equatorial places and a mirror imaging of north and south. Of course, in the case of Moscow, most of the sun's uh, presence will be only in the southern hemisphere. Whereas for Sydney, for instance, the sun will be mostly in the northern hemisphere of the sky and intermediate uh, sort of paths for cities that are between the equator and either the, the temperate zones. All right, so now let's do a quick exercise to see if we can understand where the sun would be for a city like this. This is most likely um, a Mumbai kind of location, a tropical location. Uh, sorry, it is written here. It's 41 degrees north is the location. So it's, it's further north above India somewhere because India doesn't extend beyond about 32 degrees north. So this here shows the sun path for different times of the year, sorry, different times of the day and these are different months of the year. 1st April 9 a.m. How do I know what the azimuth and altitude is? When I say position, all I need to know is the azimuth and altitude of the sun. So one can imagine, first of all, this is April, right, which is close to summer. It's not yet full summer, but it's getting close to summer and 9 a.m which means the sun has risen a few hours ago, but has not made its way very high up in the sky. So before one even puts a pencil to the sheet of paper, one can imagine the, or at least try to come up with some location in the mind's eye for where the sun would be. This is an interesting exercise to do with students. How does one go about actually identifying the specific value of azimuth and altitude? So let's proceed. The way one would do this is first identify the sun path line that would correspond to the 1st of April. So that's here. This is the red line for 1st of April, right? The second part of the solution would be to look at the 9 a.m. curve. This fixes a certain point, right? Which we indicate with a yellow dot. And to find the azimuth, what one would do is one would draw a line from the center through that dot to the edge of the of the circle which will provide the azimuth angle and as you can uh, as we know the azimuth is red from due north so this is approximately 115 degrees is the azimuth angle right what about the altitude the altitude can be read by looking at the concentric circle on which this specific intersection falls and that tells us that the azimuth is approximately oh, sorry the altitude is approximately 30 degrees right so 115 degrees which means if the if due east is 90 
azimuth angle of 15, 115 degrees, one can imagine that because the sun has risen early in the day in April, it has reached somewhere in the southwest, uh, so, sorry, southeast part of the hemisphere, 115 degrees. But because it's still only 9 a.m., the sun hasn't risen very high in the sky. It's only 30 degrees is the angle, right? And one can imagine that this azimuth and the altitude would change throughout the day. So let's conduct a second exercise for the month of October, but for 2 p.m. What would the azimuth and altitude angles be for that? We will look at that in just a second. But one can imagine that since we are t talking about 2, 2 p.m. now, not 9 a.m., the azimuth angle would be much higher because the sun would have swept a greater arc through the horizon. And also, because it's October, the angle of the sun will not be the same as April in terms of altitude. It would be slightly lower in the sky because you're getting close to October. However, because it's 2 p.m. and the sun has had a chance to rise up in the sky because of the time of the day, there is a competing influence on the actual altitude because of the later time of the day compared to 9 a.m. but also later time in the year which keeps the angle low. So let's see what the end result ends up being. All right. So these are the altitudes and azimuths for different cities in India for the same time of the day, for the same part of the year. One trend that is very visible here is that the angle of the sun in the sky, which is the altitude, is lower for the most northernmost city. So the most northernmost city here that we have is Delhi. And you will see that Delhi, in Delhi at 10 a.m. on 1st April, the sun is at 52 degrees in the sky. Whereas the southernmost city that we have here is Chennai and Bangalore. The sun is at 59 degrees in the sky. And what we can see is that the altitude is directly related to the latitude of the, of the city. So for example, Chennai and Bangalore are displaced in terms of longitude, but they have the same latitude, which is why the altitude of the sun is the same at that, at that moment. This is the situation for 2 p.m. in October, on the 1st of October. Again, you will see the same latitude, sorry, altitude of the sun for Chennai and Bangalore. And you can see very high azimuth levels compared to the previous situation of April, or sorry, of 9 a.m. This is 2 p.m. sun. So, of course, the azimuth angle has reached now the northwest, uh, sorry, the southwest part of the, of the uh, hemisphere. And you will see that the altitude angles are approximately the same because even though the, it's the, the slightly more winter kind of sun, but it's 2 p.m. and the sun has risen higher in the sky compared to 9 a.m. earlier. Here's another exercise what could conduct is what is the difference in the sun path for these kinds of cities. So you can see that two of these cities share the same latitude here, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. Now the longitudes differ, but longitudes don't have that much of an influence on the shape of the sun path. So one can imagine a certain common kind of sun path shape for, these, for this city and for this city. This one is further north, so one can imagine a, a more steep curve right, in the sun path, whereas this would be a less steep curve and slightly more symmetrical around the equator. So let's see what the four different sun paths look like in the next slide. Right. So one can imagine these two, which are not as pronounced in terms of their curve, would be the latitude 13 curves, which longitude can't really be told right now without doing some further analysis. But you can say that also that these two are for the 34 degree lat uh, latitude place. And that is signified because by the more pronounced curvature of the sun path. And as you can tell, these, they are quite different from each other even as a set. Right, so that is the 3 and 4 and 1 and 2. Now, how does one use this information, all the things that you learned about the sun's position in the sky, to actually design shading devices? This is going to be the part of the presentation from here on. Our endeavor to understand the shading needs for a building, for a thoughtfully cool building, will involve first understanding the time periods of the year for which shading is essential. As one can imagine, if the sun is at a relatively mild angle or is not at 
not present in the sky, one does not need shading at those times of the day. Also, once we have ascertained our response to this question of the when, we will then look at the types of shading devices that are most commonly available and employed in designing shading systems for buildings and also the size of these shading devices to be able to meet the shading needs. So let's understand shading requirements in terms of when do we need this in the year. So the shading requirements logically of course will be dependent on the solar radiation and as we saw in the climate consultant part of our training that the solar radiation changes at different times of the year for a certain location. So the shading needs for those periods is different from the shading needs when the solar radiation is very high, for example. And we look at how we go about actually determining the specific hours and the months of the year for which shading is needed. All right. One criteria for determining when shading is required, required is based on the amount of global horizontal radiation which has been measured in terms of watt hours per meter square. Now, according to one standard, which is the ASHRAE standard, it says that you would need shading at any facade when the amount of global horizontal solar radiation coming on it or incident upon it is more than 315.5 watt hours per meter square. For cooler places, you will need shading only when it goes beyond 630 0.9 watt hours per square meter because in cold places you want to try and trap as much heat as possible for a, for a short period of time and then use that heat later. So you wouldn't want to shield the sun when it is available to you. So this is one criteria which is sun is desired or shading is desired when the solar radiation is above this point 315 watt hours per meter square. That's criteria number one. What's the second criteria? The second criteria is the shading is required when the dry bulb temperature is above 28 degrees, which means that below 20 to 28 degrees, you need the sun. Above 28 degrees, you need shading devices. And this is what we're going to use. We're going to use the confluence of these two parameters, 315.5 watt hours per meter square and above 28 degrees to figure out which times of the year are these conditions met in for different cities in India as an exercise. All right, so uh, before we do that, here is a simple design guideline which indicates shading requirements as a function of climatic zones. However, this is not granular enough to really be used as a design tool. What we're going to do next is far more effective in terms of uh, providing a real answer that can be used in building design. All right, so let's move to that exercise. We are now going to take you through an exercise for a city of Chennai, which is its solar radiation grid. We will look at that in a second. And we will look at highlighting all cells where the solar radiation is above 315.5 watt hours per meter square. And also simultaneously look at all times of the year where the temperature is above 28. So that's when you have the compounded effect of high air temperature and high radiation. That double whammy is what we want to try and guard against and we will need shading devices for those times. So let's see how one could proceed with this. All right, so this is the global horizontal radiation chart for Chennai through the entire year, all 12 months. And these are different hours of the day, 24 hours. This year has already shaded the cells or the times of the year and the times of the day for when <coughs> the radiation levels are above 315 watt hours per meter square. As one can uh, imagine, the, those periods are usually the middle of the day periods and are quite less pronounced in the winter parts of the year. Well, it's mainly only the November, December periods where you have some sort of relief from global ra radiation here, whereas it's very high for the rest of the year. This is this, the corresponding chart which is required for designing sharing devices. This is the times of the year when the temperatures are above 28 degrees. As you can see, this is a much broader time range than the radiation component of it. And you can see, for example, in April, May, June, almost the entire month is 
uh, the period when you need shading whereas you need relatively less shading in November, December and in Jan, February and March. So depending on where your building is oriented and where your primary openings are you would need to decide whether I need shading devices in that part at all because mainly the sun is there in the earlier parts of the year or the later parts of the year right uh, or do I need shading devices all the way around the building so we're going to design this in a short while. So what one would do is one would look at this red zone which is the temperature criteria being met one would look at the yellow zone which is where the radiation criteria is being met and we would try and come up with a region where both these are applicable. So of course one can very logically see that the common areas are essentially this central part of the time and the year or sorry the months for Chennai and that is the period for which we need shading uh, in the building. The same exercise conducted for Bangalore as one can see for Bangalore one would need radi uh, uh, defense against solar radiation for a shorter period of time compared to Chennai which is because this is a much more gentle sort of climate is in the temperate zone whereas Chennai is in the hot and humid zone. Mumbai is similar to Chennai in terms of its requirements of course because they both fall in the similar sort of uh, climatic zone of India um, and the same exercise would be conducted for Mumbai and what that would lead to is it would lead to some sort of response saying that we need control from solar radiation or some sort of shading from say 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock in April, May, June and July and that's my primary radiation challenge uh, my shading challenge. So this is going to be depicted here on this chart as you can imagine the sun path diagram becomes a very effective place to depict this so let's see how that is done. Say we want shading from the months uh, from the times of 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. in March. Now how does one go about plotting that? So what one does is we find the date the line for the 1st of March right and this is the first sorry this is the 1st of March this is the 1st of April so this is the month of March right on the sun path diagram. Then we are going to look at 10 a.m. that's this line and then 5 a.m which is this line and what we want to do is we want to provide shading during this period. What this means is immediately it tells us that when we need shading the sun's angle is already depicted here. It tells us that I need a shading device that will provide me an angle of approximately 60 degrees to about 40 degrees right. So this is starting at 90, 80, 70 sorry from about 75 to about 65 degrees is the sun when I need the shading. This over here the extremities tell me what the azimuth angle will need to be of the shading device compared to my window right. So I can tell that the azimuth angle will be somewhere close to about 130 degrees on this side and on, the, on this side it will be somewhere close to about 250 degrees. So I need a shading device that could provide me with that kind of angular coverage from the window that immediately emerged from the previous exercise. All right. So this is say for example one shading requirement another one from that same chart could be I also need shading devices during this time of the year from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. in October what does that look like. So let's look at the October month all right so this is 1st of November this is 1st of October so that's the October month and now let's look at 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. in October right and then we can go ahead and shade this part. This also indicates that I need some shading in the western hemisphere or the western side of the building during these hours. I can now design a shading system which addresses the complete shading requirements for this specific building and let's see how one goes about doing that. That is the shape that I need to address. Uh, and it already gives me some clues with respect to the angles that I need to address and how broad the shading device needs to be for this purpose. All right. Now in addition to the shading needs that I need uh, to be provided artificially there are certain other uh, objects that could exist around a building for example other buildings other you know natural features for example a mountain or trees.
These can all also provide mutual shading without necessarily adding any shading devices. And what one uh, a very thoughtful designer might first want to do is look at the pre-existing shading that is already available and only size shading devices for the parts of the sun path where shading device for, where shading is not available from these permanent obstructions as they are called. So that exercise is called the shadow masking exercise and it is actually a misnomer. It is not about the shadow. It is actually about the permanent obstruction of the sky because of certain objects. We will uh, learn more about this concept in the next couple of slides. All right. So what is the shadow mask as it's called or a better term for that would be a permanent obstruction diagram. Let's demystify it. What this diagram here, a pictorial representation is showing is if I have the sun path or the, the solar protractor for a certain region which gives me the altitudes, the azimuths, etc. And if I have neighboring structures and if I were to ab if I were able to look at them from above and an aerial view was available to me and I was able to convert that three-dimensional reality into a two-dimensional representation that would look like this which means that no matter where the sun is I will never have any issues with solar radiation during this part this part of the of the sun path diagram nor here nor here nor here nor here which means that if say my sun path diagram was was here and I needed shading according to the previous exercises in this part I would not need to specifically design shading devices on my own building because this structure is providing me with the shading irrespective right so that is what's called the shadow mask diagram and let's see how one can go about generating this for your buildings uh, site right so the way this is generated is one plots the azimuth and the altitudes of neighboring buildings onto an imaginary sky dome above that point. Of course, this is easy to do if one has a sophisticated software like this, but how does one go about actually creating this with pen and paper, with a sheet uh, that has your site on it, your sun path diagram. Let's see how we can do this ourselves without softwares. All right, so uh, we'll get to that in a second. Another simple way to do this, if you already have a site, where you can, uh, where you're planning to construct your building. One could do an exercise which is called a fish eye photograph. This is essentially a picture taken of the sky from ground level at the site, which just indicates the permanent obstructions of the sky because of the neighboring structures, right? So this is what the fish eye photograph indicates that you will get shading from neighboring structures during early parts of the, if one can you know, imaginarily juxtapose the sun path diagram. This is the summer early parts of the year, early part of the day, which is sunrise. I will not have a problem because there's a building that's already providing me the shading, right? And so also in the West at sunset time, I will mainly have issues during the middle part of the day because of the kind of uh, exposure to the sun that this site presents. All right. Now, Remember that earlier picture we had shown with the projection of the neighboring structures onto the imaginary dome. How would one do this using uh, trigonometry or a simple geometry and angles? So this is the, the exercise which we are going to do now where a simple building which is adjacent to the site. So the site here is at the center of the entire coordinate system and there is a building in the northwest corner of the site where I want to now imagine or I want to predict what the permanent obstruction of the sky is going to be because of this building. So how does one go about doing this? As you can see here, it says that I need to calculate the azimuth and altitude of all the corner points of the building, which is A, B, C, D, E and F. The backward ones don't really, the ones on the other side don't really matter. So I need to calculate the azimuth an altitude of point C and point D. So let's do that first, right? So as we can see that this is about 30 degrees from the north going towards west. So the azimuth actually is 330 degrees, which is this line, right? So that's the azimuth for both these points. 
However, the altitudes are different, right? This one is at a higher altitude. This one is at zero altitude. So C would be the point over here and D would be the point over here. This is zero altitude. This is the altitude here, which is 40 degrees. As you can see, this angle is 40 degrees. So C and D are going to be represented by these two points. That will be the first line that I draw. Then I draw a line for B and E. And as you can imagine, again, the azimuth remains the same, but the altitudes differ. So that's B and E, right? So that's the second line. And the third one will be for A and F. They both have the same azimuth, of course. Again, the altitudes will be different. And once I join all of them, I get the permanent obstruction that this building will present in the sky, which will make sure that I don't have solar radiation issues when the sun is behind that building. So that is C, D, E, F and A as represented by this three-dimensional building in two-dimensional plane. All right. A simple uh, exercise one could do uh, to see if this idea has uh, immersed itself in the, in the consciousness of the, of the person is to look at a configuration of objects like this. The center point is your site. These are neighboring buildings. Can one very intuitively imagine what the shadow mask diagram for something like this would be? So these are the various options available that could be pre presented to your students if you're doing this exercise in class. And looking at the relative position of the buildings in the hemispheres itself, first of all, gives you a lot of clues. And then looking at the different kinds of shapes. So for the previous configuration, one can see that this is a shadow mask that is appropriate for this site. So this just builds on this idea and helps cement this, this con concept of coming up with a shadow mask very intuitively. All right. Now, once we have done our fisheye photograph or your shadow mask diagram has been generated. We have done the exercise with the when of the shading device that leads to a shape like this. As you can see that for the requirements, I would have needed some shading between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. between, for example, June and April. But because I'm getting adequate shading from the neighboring building, I can now shorten my shading device. I don't need coverage for that long a period of time. I can have a shorter shading device because of the neighboring shading, right? And now we're going to look at other methods that build upon this now to actually size the shading device. So what is that method? This is the next part of our training, sizing of shading devices, right? So before we do that, let's first see what kind of shading device types that, I can, uh, that are available to most designers. Two simple types of shading devices that are available are what's called a horizontal shading device, which is a overhang or in colloquial terms, it's called chajja. Or I can have what are called vertical fins. These are perpendicular to the building and are perpendicular to the ground as well, right? So these are vertical fins and horizontal shading devices are overhangs that project out of the building. All right, so let's look at the kind of shadow masks or permanent obstruction of the sky, a simple horizontal or vertical shading device will create, which will help me create the kind of shading pattern that will completely cover up the shading requirements as depicted in the yellow image earlier. So let's start looking at, at this. Now this is a, 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 a protractor that we're gonna use. It's called a solar protractor to see how different kinds of shading devices provide different coverage in terms of shade. This is for a horizontal shading device. Sorry, this is for a vertical shading device, which provides me with horizontal shade. This part of the protractor will be used for looking at what's called a vertical shading angle for when I have a horizontal shading device. All right. So this is the corresponding sun path diagram, which we're going to use to see what the shadow looks like on the protractor. Right, that's the vertical shading angle that is on the top side of the protractor. All right, so this is a building which is facing south. As you can imagine in this protractor, this is north, 
this is east, this is west, this is south. Here is a relatively short shearing device which is at a very you know, steep angle which means it can only provide me coverage for the sun which is above 80 degrees which means if the sun was here the sun's shade or the sun's rays will not fall in the building but if the sun is anywhere lower than 80 degrees that shade the sun sorry will come into the building and I will get no shading so this is of course when you look at it in terms of a shadow mask you can see that it provides me with relatively meager coverage of the vertical shading angle which is here right and as you can imagine as I extend this horizontal shading device I am able to get coverage for lower and lower altitudes of the sun all the way up to zero I would I could extend this infinitely and the sun would never ever affect me because even when the sun is at the horizon I will not see any solar radiation in my building so let's see what that would look like for a horizontal shading device which gives me protection of 60 degrees of the sun's altitude this is what the obstruction diagram will look like right this is the vertical shading angle that I can get protection against and as you can see this is all this all can be pieced together to completely eclipse or cover up the part of the shade of the sun path diagram which was revealed as having needing shading to begin with this is what happens as I keep extending it right so one can just keep inferring how this would proceed if we increase the the depth of the shading device right so the depth of the shading device provides me with more altitude coverage the width of the shading device right the extent to which it covers the window and even projects beyond the window determines the amount of azimuth that I am able to cover so as I go wider and wider I can see that I am able to cover more hours of the day All right so let's see what that does on this sun path diagram so now I have kept the depth the same the D is the same but now I have doubled the width of the shading device and that causes a doubling of the number of hours through which I can shade the building this is the same sort of narrow width but now doubling the depth so as I can see I have doubled the angle of coverage which means now I can account for a lower and lower sun which means even the winter sun does not bother this specific window so that was all about the horizontal shading device which was giving me vertical shading angle protection let's look at the corresponding case of a vertical fin right which is projecting outward from the building but it is perpendicular to the ground right not parallel to the ground so this is the plane view of, of a vertical shading device and as you can see this is the starting point here it's for <coughs> a very small azimuth coverage right it won't give me protection for most of the day because the moment the sun comes out of this part of the azimuth for a large part I will have solar radiation coming in so only for a few hours will I be protected from the sun this is how this is depicted on the sun path diagram this is the vertical shading angle so this is say for a north facing window right facing north 80 degrees is the horizontal shading angle so if the sun was here I would be protected but the moment the sun moves out I have direct solar radiation it's not covered so let's see what happens when we keep extending it as you can see as I keep extending or deepening my fins I get more and more azimuth coverage and I can continue doing that to be able to cover as much of the sun path as I need to based on the earlier exercise that I had conducted Right. so this is what happens when I go to an extreme vertical Oh, sorry horizontal shading angle of 30 degrees which means only 60 degrees of the sky are left for coverage otherwise I am completely protected uh, from the sun's uh, rays and, and solar radiation issues right. now just like we saw that the, the depth of, of the uh, horizontal overhang changes the amount of as uh, azimuth coverage I'm getting I can do the same thing with changing depth of the fins as I double the depth of the fin I get more azimuth coverage right here is 
the azimuth coverage for this depth, here is the azimuth coverage for this depth and as you can see this is giving me protection from the eastern sun, this is giving me protection from the western sun. All right. So you can see that vertical and horizontal shading devices can create shading patterns which I can piece together, it's almost like a you know piecing together a jigsaw puzzle to get the kind of shape that I want. There are the two uh, kinds of shading devices and what are their relative uses in which situation should we use which. Here we can see that horizontal shades provide wide azimuth coverage and a narrow altitude coverage right because of their width spans the length of the of the uh, sun path diagram it gives me lots of uh, coverage in terms of hours but I would need to go really deep to get coverage against a low angle sun which is why in general to cover against a low angle sun people use vertical shading devices for short periods of the day right. Okay, so horizontal shading devices are good for azimuth coverage. They provide protection for many hours of the day for some months of the year, right? But not for too many months of the year because you'd need to go really deep. It's ideal for south facing windows in the northern hemisphere. The reason why we say this is because in the south, the sun, by the time the sun gets to the south part of the building, the sun is relatively high, which means a small shading device with a very high vertical shading angle will do the job. It is not very suitable for eastern and western sides because the sun is very low there and you would need a very very deep overhang to be able to cut that sun out which is why in general on the western and eastern sides you will see vertical fins. So let's get to the vertical shades now. It says that you get narrow azimuth coverage which means it only works for a few hours of the of the, the the day because the moment the sun has gone beyond that azimuth the sun starts coming in right so what one would do is one would try and first have a certain facade where you limit that low angle sun eastern and western and then provide short vertical shading devices they provide some protection uh, some hours of protection for many months of the year and it's ideal for east and west facing windows in the northern hemisphere right so these are some General rules of thumbs, of course, there are instances where you would need to, you know, break away from this rule of thumb and do very custom specific design. But these are general principles that are applicable in many, many building designs. Now, now that we know the two different kinds of shading devices, how does one go about sizing them? Which means determining the D and the W, which is the, the depth of the overhang and how wide it should be, right? So let's uh, look at a couple of uh, mechanisms that we can use to do that. The first method we're going to look at is called the graphical method which uses what's called a sun angle calculator. It's very similar to the exercise we did with the azimuth and the altitude earlier. And the second is a numerical method, right? Um, and that requires the use of spreadsheets, so on and so forth. So we're not really going to get into that. We're just going to focus right now on the graphical method and computer simulations again can be done using sophisticated softwares. Again, not the subject of our training session today. So let's focus on what's called the graphical method of shading device design. Okay, to be able to do this uh, or utilize this method of design, one must first know the altitude of the sun at any given time that you want to block the radiation from and the horizontal shading angle. Now what is this horizontal shading angle? It is basically the angle made by the azimuth of the window. So if you draw a line that is normal to the window and if I figure out the azimuth of the sun which is this angle, if I've dropped a line from the sun to the horizon, this is my azimuth angle. If I take my solar azimuth angle as it's called and I look at my window azimuth angle, the subtraction of the two is what's called the horizontal shading angle which we will look at in the next slide. So this is what I need, one part of the equation. The second thing that I need to know is what's called the vertical shading angle, right? Not the sun altitude but the vertical shading angle which means the angle the sun would make if it was at noon above my location. What is that angle the sun would make? That's called the vertical shading angle. Using the vertical shading angle, horizontal shading angle, sun altitude and the 
window azimuth, I will be able to calculate the size of or the width of this, the depth of this for either a vertical or a horizontal shearing device. There's a, another diagram which makes this even clearer, the thing about the window azimuth and the solar azimuth. As we saw earlier, if you draw a line perpendicular to, window, to the window, this is the window here, I'm drawing a line perpendicular to window, that's my window azimuth. If I look at the sun and drop a line down here and look at that angle, that's my solar azimuth. The subtraction of the two is what's called my horizontal shading angle, right? And I have my altitude of the sun and I will also need my vertical shading angle which we will use in the design going further. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out what should be the depth of the fin if it's a vertical fin or what should be the width of the overhang if it's an overhang and also the depth of the overhang. How does one go about actually doing this graphically? Say if I didn't have this information measured, which is what is the altitude of the sun? Say I decide that I want to cut the sun's radiation from 1st of April to the 2nd or to the 1st of June, April, May, June. Uh, that's two months, right? What do I do to actually manifest this into a solution? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what's called a sun angle calculator. This is very similar to the charts that we have seen earlier. Essentially, it is a sun path diagram with the solar protractor overlaid on it. So what I'm first going to do is I am going to draw a line which represents or first mark out a line which represents the day of the year that I want to start my shading on. So 1st April, I will first for example draw this dark line which is a sun path that is of interest to me and then I will figure out what is the time I want that shading to start. For example, my shading problems begin at say 11 in the afternoon. So I will find the 11 o'clock time for that day and that will mark my starting point for the shading design. The moment I have that marked on the what's called the solar protractor, I will immediately get what is called my profile angle. This is the angle the sun will make when it is at noon above that location. That's my profile angle or the vertical shading angle. So I've already gotten that. What I will also then do is I will use what's called a cursor or just simply draw a line. The cursor is just so that you can keep using this device over and over. I will then take a line and go across the intersection of that hour and the day and go all the way down to the periphery which will give me the azimuth or the bearing. This will allow me to figure out the solar azimuth and if I can subtract the window azimuth the subtraction of the bearing and the solar azimuth sorry and the window azimuth will give me what's called the horizontal shading angle. So the first one is called the VSA vertical shading angle which I got from this line the red line and this is going to give me my horizontal shading angle. Once I have these two I am now able to calculate the depth and the width of my shading devices which is depicted in the next chart. Let's just uh, reiterate those equations. The horizontal shading angle is nothing but a subtraction of the solar azimuth with the surface or the window azimuth. The subtraction of the two gives me the horizontal shading angle. This is also in some cases known as the bearing, right? which is how it was depicted in the previous one. Once I have that, I take the cosine of that angle, I take the sun's altitude, right? which was the profile angle which we got from the previous chart, once I have done the tangent of that and taken the cosine of the horizontal shading angle, I am able to calculate my vertical shading angle. The depth of the overhang that I need is nothing but the height of the window divided by the tangent of that vertical shading angle. That gives me the depth. It tells me how deep my shading device needs to be. The width of the shading device is nothing but the depth into, into the tangent of the horizontal shading angle. These two for either the horizontal or the vertical shearing device help me figure out how deep and how wide the slab of concrete needs to be if it's a concrete shearing device. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us.
uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you. Thank you.